My name is Michael DeTurbin. I'm the Associate Dean of the Schulen School of Law, and I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to the second Innis Christie Symposium in Labor and Employment Law. Of course, I'd like to extend a very special welcome to Innis' family who is here today. Let me begin with the subject of the symposium, Professor Innis Christie. Um, Innis was born and raised in Nova Scotia. He started his academic career at Queen's University in 1964. And in 1971, he returned to Nova Scotia and took up the post, thankfully for us, at the Dalhousie Law School, where he taught full-time until 2003 and then part-time until 2007. He also served as our dean from 1985 to 1991. Innes' teaching interests included uh, labor and employment law, uh, municipal law, administrative law, commercial law, and professional ethics, but he really was a giant in the labor law field. He was a leading role in law, he had a leading role in law reform. For example, he was engaged in the Woods Task Force on Labor Relations in Canada in 1967. He drafted the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act in 1973 with former Dean Reed, and the Nova Scotia Labor Standards Code in 1972. He served in the 1970s as a member of the Canadian Anti-Inflation Appeal Tribunal, was counsel to the Nova Scotia Labor uh, Standards Tribunal, and was chair of the Nova Scotia Labor Relations Board. In addition, Innes was deputy minister in the Nova Scotia Department of Labor and served as a member and chair of the Nova Scotia Workers' Compensation Board. Innes was dean uh, during my years at uh, the law school, and I guess that's how I remember him best. Um, he shepherded the school through the aftermath of the 1985 fire that destroyed, of course, much of our library. But Innes demonstrated that a great school is far more than just bricks and mortar, and he always insisted that we, the students and graduates of this law school, uh, were the identity of that law. And he was genuinely interested in our careers. And if you'll permit me, just one small reminiscence of Innes. Um, after I graduated, I headed to Toronto, came back, and a couple of years later, um, I got a call from Innes inviting me to come uh, to dinner at his place. And he was surprised to know that I was back in town, and he wanted to catch up and see how things were going. And we had a lovely dinner, my wife and I, with John and Innes at their place over on Cobra Road. And to this day, I'm not quite sure why, uh, why he extended that invitation, but I think it is indicative of Innes' thoughtfulness and generosity towards his former students, because he really genuinely was interested in our careers. This Innes Christie Symposium in Labor and Employment Law honors his life and his work. The gift that provides support for this symposium was initiated by the firm King Larkin, and many thanks to them and to everybody who subsequently contributed to ensure that we have such a substantive and rich way of continuing to honor Professor, Professor Christie's contributions. And I'll extend a final note of thanks to Bruce Archibald, who took on the task of chairing the committee that brought our eminent speaker to be with us here today. I now call upon Professor Archibald to introduce Professor Brian Lane. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, my old friend, maybe I should say dear friend, not old, uh, Brian Langell. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, important for me to uh, say something substantial about uh, Brian's career so that you just don't think that uh, the invitation to Brian was simply a matter of cronyism. Um, but uh, we have with us uh, an extraordinary thinker in the area of uh, labor law and employment law and somebody who has a global reputation. And uh, it's a, a wonderful thing that uh, Brian comes from Truro, Nova Scotia, and that uh, his brother, uh, his uh, sister-in-law are here, as well as his wife Cindy, uh, who also comes from Truro. And uh, Brian went to Acadia University in uh, the late 60s, where you will be able to tell probably he, that he studied philosophy. Uh, he then came to Dalhousie Law School and uh, graduated with that illustrious class of uh, 1975. Uh, almost as illustrious as the previous year's graduating class, but that's another issue. Um, 
And, and from that class, there graduated uh, a number of, of labor lawyers who have gone on to uh, really uh, be leaders in the profession. And of course, that they were under the, the, uh, the mentorship of uh, Venice Christie, which was a very demanding and exciting uh, mentorship at the time. Venice had just uh, come back to the law school, had drafted this new legislation, uh, and we were all enthralled by the energy and capacity and um, good humor uh, and yet demanding kind of uh, things that he, he got out of his students. And Brian, of course, was one of them. Um, after going to Oxford, uh, where he continued his uh, study in the area of labor and employment law, Brian came back here to teach uh, in 1978, and we were lucky to have him on faculty until 1983, I think it was, when he was drawn away to the University of Toronto, um, where he's been ever since. And uh, Brian uh, began to make his mark uh, early in his academic career, uh, where he wrote this famous article about uh, labor law being a subset of employment law and began the thinking about a, a kind of unified field of labor market regulation that uh, uh, Innes had obviously instilled the idea through his uh, tutorship um, and Brian brought it to fruition and it became the kind of conceptual way that the national labor law Facebook uh, was organized, uh, and we, we now have that uh, casebook in its eighth edition, and uh, it's going strong. And Brian is now one of the key leaders in that um, exercise. So he's continuing to have his impact on students across the country through that. He's also, as uh, he was just saying, that he enjoys still. Um, being a labor arbitrator, and how he does this, I don't know, because he has been an acting dean and interim dean at the University of Toronto uh, for several years. He's uh, run their graduate program. He's been a, an advisor to um, the Canadian government and provincial governments in matters of labor relations. Uh, he's been writing up a storm of late, um, and some of the um, the uh, titles you might be interested in, Core Labor Rights. My favorite one actually is New Platforms and New Paradigms for Labor Law, uh, which he doesn't include. I don't know why I include that on uh, your formal uh, biography that you uh, sent along, but it's one of my favorites. But um, there are also, Brian is not only interested in international development and working with the International Labor Law Organization, which he's done and represented Canada and delegations there, uh, but has taken, uh, since the BC Health Services case, an interest in constitutional law and uh, labor law, and writing things like, is there a constitutional right to strike in Canada? Why are Canadian judges drafting labor codes and constitutionalizing the Wagner Act? Bad idea in his view, although not in the view of some others. So there's an interesting controversy going on at the moment. But he's been writing about core labor standards at the international level. Uh, he's been doing a whole lot of things that uh, are important. He's just edited a book uh, and it's just arrived in our library called The Idea of Labor Law, which he edited with uh, a fellow by the name of Guy Davidoff, and it, like a previous book that uh, Brian has edited, brings together the foremost labor law and employment law thinkers around the world. It's a, so um, Brian's playing uh, in a, in a, on a national and international stage, uh, which is of great significance. Um, Brian is uh, the second uh, Innes Christie visiting lecturer. The, Harry Arthur's last year participated in the symposium, as you will recall, and um, 
Brian this year is the first uh, visiting Ennis Christie uh, professor to give a course to students. So he's been giving us a short course to students. I've been attending and learning a whole lot. We've been working hard two hours a day uh, and uh, it's been great fun and uh, many of those students are here and uh, so you don't want to listen to me anymore. Thanks Brian for coming here and we're going to hear about why the freedoms and rights distinction is important to labor lawyers, and I gotta say, from what we've been discussing in Brian's class, it's important to all of us, whether we're labor law specialists or not. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you uh, <coughs> very much, Bruce, for that excessively kind uh, introduction. Um, let me uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, Dean Brooks and the faculty for sending to me this wonderfully meaningful invitation to come back home to Dow to give uh, this lecture in Innes's name. Uh, let me say thanks too to the faculty and staff who've made my stay here both easy uh, and warm. Thanks to Bruce for being a perfect uh, host. Thanks to the members of my seminar, which Bruce just referred to, for giving me a lot of rope and daring to engage in the enterprise we're currently engaged in. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun, and uh, they're here under duress, actually. This is part of the course. Uh, and let me finally say thanks to my brother Don and his wife Deb for putting us up and putting up with us uh, during this uh, more than a week long stay uh, here in Halifax. Now, Ines Christie was my teacher, he was my mentor, my colleague, and my greatest supporter. He was unrelentingly generous to me and on my behalf, even when I screwed up. He is the reason I am a labor lawyer, and he is the reason I am an academic. I am profoundly, as are many, in his eternal debt. It is one of the true honors, and I speak with deep sincerity here, uh, of my life to be asked to give this lecture in his name. Now, a lot has been said and said well about the magnificent arc of Innes's uh, career. Innes has been and long will be justly celebrated and acknowledged for his teaching, for his shaping of generations of law students, for his academic writing, for his academic leadership, not only as dean but throughout his career, for his public service, for his strengths as an adjudicator, for his national reputation as an arbitrator, and, as Harry Arthurs reminded us last year in the first lecture, for his influence on the very way people think about his field of law. But at the core of all these accomplishments was the real person, Innes. He embodied all that our profession aspires to. He was smart, he was principled, he had great judgment, he worked hard, he asked a lot of himself, and he expected others to do the same. He was decent, he was humane, he was down to earth, he was competitive, and he liked to laugh. In a world which increasingly seems to have far too few of them, he was a real hero. Martin Luther King famously said on the Washington Mall that he had a dream of a day when people, quote, would not be judged by the color of their skin. Most people remember that. Sometimes they forget that Dr. King went on to say, but by the content of their character. Innes was a man of sterling character, and the example he set by simply being Innes, I believe, why we remember and honor him so. Innes showed that being a wonderful person was not simply comp compatible with a great career in law, but essential to it. Now, in this lecture in Innes' honor, I've made the decision, risky, uh, to make an argument. Uh, it's an argument I hope that Innes would have liked. I'm not sure he would have agreed with it, but I like to think that he would have liked the cut of its jib. Um, I think this because the argument is a bit old fashioned because it tries to take legal thinking seriously on its own terms, because its theory is close to the ground and is actually found in some very simple first year law school type ideas, because some fundamental labor issues are at stake and because it claims that what is at stake is important for all Canadians, not just Canadian workers. 
I'd also like to think that Innes would have liked the cut of its jib because it is somewhat contrarian. It goes against the grain of much current thought in some pretty high places like the Supreme Court of Canada. The fact that powerful people in high places say things does not make them true. I know that's a view that Innes shared. Finally, I like to think Innes would have liked the cut of its jib because the argument is made in the faith that clear thinking will, in the end, win out. Now, Innes was not naive. He did not think that clear thinking was all we required in order to make the world a better place. But he understood deeply that without clear thinking, nothing worthwhile will come our way. Now, before I make the argument in a number of steps, uh, a word about what the argument is about and where it is going and why I think it is, is important. Now, I think most of you will know that on October 12th of this year, Federal Minister of Labor, Lisa Raitt, issued the following edict in connection with the Air Canada flight attendance negotiations. Quote, I hereby direct the Canada Industrial Relations Board to either impose a new collective agreement on the parties or impose final binding arbitration to resolve outstanding terms of the collective agreement. And this order ended with a especially imperial flourish that I like, I must add, quote, in witness whereof the Minister of Labor has hereto set her hand this 12th day of October 2012. Now, my view is that this is entirely chilling, and we should all wake up to that fact. In Putin's Russia or in China, overt connections between state executives and powerful private interests are common, and respect for fundamental freedoms of ordinary citizens hard to find. It's not supposed to be that way here. Now, if you find this a bit strong, I ask you to consider what immediately preceded this edict. The ministers claimed that there was a serious essential services issue, that is, and I quote the test, an immediate and serious danger to the safety or health of the public, close quote, which was to be referred to the board, which would have the effect of delaying any strike. I view it as a serious comment on the current state of our democracy when a minister of the crown can, almost winking at us, make such a transparently unfounded and equally transparently motivated claim in any circumstances, let alone when serious issues and fundamental freedoms are at strike. Now, for me, perhaps the worst part of all this was the reaction of a large part of the Canadian public and the Canadian media that this is normal business. This, I'm all right, Jack, seems to be an increasingly new component of the morality of our time. Now, the good news is that this sort of exercise of state power is, in my view, illegal. Uh, this is what the most important cases we read in law school tell us. Ron Corelli and Duplessis, Smith and Ruland, more recently, the Insight Safe Injection case. As these cases show, unlike Russia or China, we still have a judicial system with the power and the will to enforce our basic ideas about living in a society governed by law and not by executive command. Now, here I'm getting closer to my argument. There's a problem, however, in, case, in connection with cases like Air Canada. The argument here is that we are at risk when it comes to getting the Air Canada case correctly decided, straightened out. This is because it has a constitutional dimension. And any challenge to Minister Raitt's actions will be argued in the Air Canada case, in the Post Office case, and others that will come our way as a Section 2D of the Charter Freedom of Association case. And I think the Supreme Court of Canada has unnecessarily but darkly muddied the waters of Section 2D. And that as a result, we are in grave danger when it comes to the court's ability to get this one right. What I wish to do here, and what my argument is about, is to clarify our thinking about freedom of association, to clarify the waters, to remove what I see as a clear and present danger to our ability to, what, to do what has to be done in situations of the sort we now confront. Now, I know some people in the room are not labor lawyers. A lot of you are labor lawyers. But for those of you who are not, just a brief note, this argument and this lecture is about the most important labor law decisions of my lifetime. They're called Dunmore, BC, as in British Columbia Health Services, and Fraser. Now, let me just note for the non-labor lawyers that in 2007, in the BC Health Services case, the Supreme Court of Canada, following an opening that it had created for itself in 2001 in the Dunmore decision, dramatically overturned 20 years of charter jurisprudence and held that our constitutional guarantee of freedom of association, Section 2D, protects collective bargaining. As most people put it, the court held that there is a constitutional right 
to collectively bargain. The 2011 Fraser decision affirms this holding, basically. But in those cases, the court expressly did not decide whether there is a constitutional right to strike. It left that question explicitly open for another day. This is the issue that's on the table now. Is there a constitutional right to strike? This is the issue which has been placed front and center by the actions of our federal government in Air Canada and elsewhere. Now, the problem is these most important decisions of my lifetime are deeply confused in their thinking. This confusion stands in the way of the court getting the abuses of power we witness under legal control. They will, if not addressed, block a much needed response equal in power to Ron Corelli and Duplessis or Smith and Rowland. But my interest in the case is even deeper. Their potential to do harm is very basic and extends beyond Air Canada and beyond the labor law area. They are a threat to our rights and freedoms in general. Uh, that is, I believe that what they say is quite wrong and wrong in a way which affects all of our fundamental freedoms and rights. Now, here's the core of the argument. This is because these cases misunderstand a crucial distinction, the distinction between rights and freedoms. The Supreme Court of Canada not only confuses the distinction I seek to defend, but it purports to be positively hostile to it. In Frazier, the majority actually says, and I quote, the charter cannot be separated into two kinds of guarantees, rights and freedoms, close quote. This is, in my view, a really unfortunate remark to have your Supreme Court utter, akin only to someone saying, there's no distinction between a pop fly out and a home run. You can't make that true by saying, okay? Concepts have a grammar, you don't get to make them up. Now, how will the argument proceed? Uh, the argument starts with some very basic reminders about private law, that is common law, it does so because I believe we have to do this to see what's really going on in our constitutional cases. Some of our most important cases in the history of Canadian labor law, heresies of Woodstock, Pepsi Cola, will be prominent in my examples, are about private law ideas. They are about the common law. The problem is these very basic ideas often go AWOL, they often go missing. Sometimes they show back up again. Legal life is always better when they don't go missing. Now, after having talked about the common law of rights and freedoms, I will argue that these very basic common law ideas are required to understand what our basic labor law statutes are up to. In order to understand what the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act actually does, we have to start back with the world the common law, and then we can see clearly uh, what the statute is doing in terms of our basic ideas. Finally, I make, this, make the claim that our basic ideas not only make our common law and statutes clear, they are also required to make sense of all of our recent constitutional litigation regarding freedom of association. That is, we need these basic ideas to see what's really going on in Dunmore, BC Health, and Fraser. Now, my argument, it should be plain by now, is that we will never be able to understand what is so dangerously wrong with the Fraser case and never be in a position to right the wrongs of Air Canada without our basic ideas coming home and shedding their light on these most important cases. So the argument goes in a number of steps, but it basically goes common law, statute law, constitutional law. Okay. Here are the basic ideas which often go missing. The first is this. It is the distinction between rights and freedoms. There is, in spite of what the Supreme Court says, a basic distinction between freedoms and rights. It is this. Rights have to do with what I can demand that you do. Pay me $1,000 because I've got a court order telling you to do that. Or not do, not assault me. Rights are about what I can demand that you do or not do. Freedoms are about what I can do. In some deep sense, they have nothing to do with you. Okay. Freedoms are about what I am free to do or not do, to speak or not, to think this or not this, to join a union or not, to worship a god or not. That's what freedoms are about. It makes no sense, therefore, it's a bit of conceptual confusion, 
for anyone to say, quote, I have a right to free speech, close quote. I do not have a right to free speech. Right? I have the freedom to speak. That's the distinction that I'm after. Now, you're saying, oh my god, this is crazy. Everybody says that all the time. How is this possible? It, people do say it all the time. Normal non-lawyers say it. Lawyers say it. Judges say it. The Supreme Court of Canada says it. I find myself slipping into it from time to time. It's a natural way to speak, to say I have a right to free speech. Why? If it's conceptual nonsense, why do people speak this way? Well, I see it as follows. We may understand why people make this uh, way of speaking ordinary, but not excuse it, by the fact that my freedom of speech, for example, is in fact protected by what I will call, and others have called, a perimeter of what are precisely and accurately called rights. So, you cannot put your hand over my mouth to stop me exercising my freedom to speak. Or, you cannot send a bunch of thugs around to beat me up to stop me joining a union. Those would be torts. Those would be assaults. These tort rights that I have against you, that you not assault me, right, are part of the background, normally applicable, in place legal rules that all of us have all of the time. And they apply to all of us equally. In some sense, this is the problem with the common law. Right? It has a very formal view of equality here. But you have exactly the same contract rights as I do. Employers and employees have exactly the same freedoms as, as, as each other. We all have the same tort rights. There is a general background distribution of equal uh, rights and freedoms that the common law has in place. So I think this confusion, this way of speaking, is created by the fact that they, we do have rights that protect my freedom to speech. But on the view I'm advising that we keep focused on, we have to be really clear that what I actually have a a right to is that you not assault me when I am exercising my freedom to speak. Those are two separate legal matters. Now, that's the first idea. It is really fundamental, yet people lose sight of it. Now, even more primitive is the second idea. This is the distinction between your actions that affect me and my interests on the one hand and your actions which violate my legal rights on the other. So, Troy has already been mentioned. Let's use this example. I am free to start a restaurant in Truro. So are you. My restaurant may have a big impact on your restaurant and your interests and your exercise of your freedoms. If I start a restaurant and it is very good, it may drive your not very good restaurant out of business. Although most likely the other way around. There seems to be a lot of terrible restaurants are driving very good establishments out of business. But leaving that aside as an empirical matter, right, your, the exercise of your freedom may have a really significant impact on my interests and the way things turn out for me. But I have not violated, and you have not violated, my legal rights. My exercise of my freedom has had an impact upon your exercise of your freedom and upon your material interests. But here the freedoms simply contend or contest in fact. They do not conflict in law. So, here are the two basic ideas, the distinction between rights and freedoms, and secondly, the distinction between things you do that affect my interests and things you do that actually violate my legal rights. Now, uh, there is, there is some, an, a third idea that follows from those four, first two. Let me just briefly mention it, um, and we often lose sight of this as well. It follows from these two ideas, which often go missing, that we cannot even get into court, and we have no worries about a judge trying to balance the exercise of our freedoms. The idea of a judge weighing up our interests is foreign to our understanding of freedoms. We do not want, and we do not expect, a judge to weigh up which of the two competing restaurants in Truro deserves to win. But so too, if you violate my rights, then there is also no balancing. We do not want, and we do not get judges saying things like, quote, yes, the defendants burned down your restaurant, but you must understand they had vital interests at stake. Right? They have rent to pay, they have a payroll, they have three kids in college. So I really have to take their interests into, into account and balance them with yours. We don't get that. We don't want that. That is absolutely, fundamentally, legally bad thinking to even entertain the idea of a judge balancing contending freedoms. Okay.
And if we have a violation of right, we don't get balancing either. We simply go from the violation of the right to a vindication of it, unmediated by any balancing or proportionality type test. Now, let me give you an example of the lost ideas in action or the lost ideas not in action or ideas lost in action. I'm not sure what the right way of actually putting this is. And it is the famous 1963 Ontario Court of Appeal decision in Heresies of Woodstock. Every labor lawyer knows this by heart almost. For those of you who are not labor lawyers, the facts were really simple. There was a labor dispute at a shirt manufacturing plant. The union approached a retail store selling the shirts and asked the store to stop selling it. The store owner refused. The union picketed the store. Two men walked up and down on the public sidewalk with a sign which read, quote, attention shoppers, Deacon Brothers, the name of the struck manufacturer, sportswear sold at Hersey's, the name of the shop, and they handed out leaflets. All very peaceful, all very Canadian. Um, I'm reminded of that New Yorker cartoon. Sometimes when I'm in the States and people ask me to explain the difference between Canada and America on labor law and other things, I use this example. Well, in Canada, uh, people are pretty moderate. And there's a New Yorker cartoon called The Revolt of the Moderates. And it's a two-panel cartoon. And it shows a bunch of people walking down the street, signs. And there's a man at the front with a megaphone. And he uh, yells out, what do we want? And the crowd yells back, meaningful change. Second panel, when do we want it? And the crowd yells back, in due course. <laughs> the facts of heresies remind me of this. So very peaceful picketing, all very Canadian. Now, back to here. The Ontario Court of Appeal went on to make a mess of the analysis of some economic torts, especially inducing breach of contract. And let me just interject to say this is the kind of sloppy thinking that Innes was an expert at exposing. Uh, but then the court famously, almost wonderfully went on. It's almost too good to be true to have a court say this sort of thing. Uh, the following, quote, but even assuming that the picketing carried on by the union was lawful in the sense that it was merely peaceful picketing for the purposes of only communicating information, I think it should be restrained. That's a nice empirical flourish. The store owner has a right lawfully to engage in its business of retailing merchandise to the public. Therefore, the right, if there be such a right, of the union to engage in picketing of the store owner's premises must give way to the store owner's right because the latter is a right far more fundamental and of far greater importance. Now, here's the immediate payoff. That is just legal nonsense and we have just reviewed the reasons why, right? Our three ideas show why. First, the store owner does not have a right to engage in business, it has a freedom. The workers do not have a right to pick it, they have the freedom to do so. Second, these freedoms do not and cannot conceptually conflict in law at all. They merely contend or contest in fact. Third, when there is no violation of legal right, as the judge says, even assuming the picketing was peaceful and it was, was lawful, we do not need and should not get into any balancing test at all. So our three ideas here are just perfectly mappable onto this most famous Ontario Court of Appeal decision. For me, this is the point we're discussing in class today, the problem with the judge saying that the right to trade is, quote, far more fundamental than the right of the workers to picket is not that it is wrong, although you may agree with me that freedom of speech is right up there with the best of them in terms of fundamentalness. But my, my point is not that it's wrong, it is rather that for a judge to say anything is an insult to the basics of our legal system, which we have just reviewed. Now, my view is there's no judicial work to be done here at all. Yes, the store owner's interest may have been affected. Some consumers stopped buying shirts in solidarity, but not its rights. Just as a store owner carrying on selling the shirts may have a negative impact on, this, on the interests of the striking workers. But this is all legally meaningless. There is nothing to adjudicate here. There is no violation of a right. But we need our basic ideas to see this. Right? When we do keep our eyes on these basic ideas, we see that Heresies of Woodstock is just our two restaurants in Toronto. In Toronto, how about that? In Toronto uh, example. 
right? And we want and need the same solution to heresies as we want and need to the two restaurants in Toronto. That's right. I've been away for almost 30 years. It's hard to get back in the Toronto groove. Um, now, here's the partially good news, I think. Sometimes our lost ideas, like prodigal sons, find their way home, as they did in Canada in 2002 in the Supreme Court of Decision, Supreme Court of Canada decision in Pepsi-Cola. Uh, in that case, Hersey's of Woodstock was relegated to the legal scrap heap. Pepsi is a beautiful decision. Why? Because it keeps its eye on the ball of these three basic legal ideas and gets them right. The facts were essentially identical to Hersey's, striking workers from a Pepsi plant, picketed retail stores, selling Pepsi products. But the approach that the employer complains, seeks an injunction, relying on heresies of Woodstock. But the approach taken in Pepsi is exactly the opposite of that taken in heresies, and explicitly so. It is an approach which goes back to our legal basics and gets them right. The lost ideas find their way home. The Supreme Court said the correct approach was to hold that picketing, even secondary, is to be permitted unless it involves a legal wrong, a violation of a right a tort or a crime. This is, as we have seen, surely correct. There is no need for balancing, for a court or anyone else other than the parties and the consumers being appealed to here to make a decision about how to respond, confronted with this contest of freedoms, uh, to try to balance these freedoms is an affront to the very idea of freedom. Now. That's the end of the common law story. I'm about to make the move from common law to statutes. And the plea here is, the idea here is, these really simple ideas that we've been discussing that went missing in heresies but came home in Pepsi are really important to understand what statutes like the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act are all about. Now, many people in this room live with the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act on a daily basis. They know it off by heart. I think what I'm going to say, though, um, may be something that people haven't thought about in at least a little while. Let me start by saying this. So at common law, there is a common law of freedom of association. We've, we've just seen it. Uh, I'm free to speak at common law. That's protected by a perimeter of tort rights. I'm free to associate with you at common law. That's protected by a perimeter of tort rights. Um, that perimeter of background rights protects my exercise of the freedom against other private actors. So if the employer sends around a bunch of goons to beat me up because I want to join a union, right, that's a tort that protects my exercise of my freedom to associate with other workers. But sometimes we as a society make the decision that we need to do more than protect basic freedoms to speak, to associate, and so on, with more than just the normally in place background set of rights and freedoms that we all share all the time. Sometimes we construct what I believe are properly called derivative rights. That is, rights derived from the freedom for the purpose of protecting the exercise of the freedom. That is, sometimes we interfere with the freedoms of others in order to protect workers' freedoms to associate. We alter the background rules. We trade freedom for freedom. Labor lawyers are very, very familiar with this move. It's what the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act or the Ontario Labor Relations Act is all about. It's all about reallocating, rejigging, right? The neutral, in place, everybody has an all time background set of rights and freedoms. Now, we alter the background rules. Now, the foundational section of the Ontario Labor Relations Act is Section 5, which has the beauty of being correctly worded. It says, every person is free to join a trade union of the person's own choice and to participate in its lawful activities. That is what the statute is all about. It's about that freedom. It doesn't care how you exercise that freedom. It doesn't care whether you join a union or not join a union. What it's about is the freedom to choose either way. Okay? And it actually uses the word free, which is really, really important. I tell my students in labor law, that's what the statute is all about. The rest is just detail protecting Section 5. Now, if all we had was Section 5, we would have the normally in place perimeter of tort rights. You can't send a bunch of thugs around to beat me up because that would be an assault 
perimeter of protection around the freedom, right? But that's not all there is. The reason we have the Trade Union Act, the Ontario Labor Relations Act, and statutes of similar ilk all across the country and in North America, and the reason we have the Wagner Act model, as people like to call it, increasingly so these days, uh, is that we're not content with the normal background set of rights, rights and duties. So the point of the statute is to articulate Section 5, the freedom, and then beef that up with a set of not normally in place, not background, quite special derivative rights aimed at protecting Section 5, aimed at protecting the freedom. So for those of you who don't read the Act, there are, there are two basic categories of provisions here that I want to talk about, the unfair labor practice provisions and the duty to bargain in good faith provision. Section 53.3 says, for example, no employer and no person acting on behalf of an employer shall refuse to employ or to continue to employ any person because that person is or was a member of the trade union. I won't take you through the other provisions, uh, but there are other unfair labor practice provisions aimed at protecting the freedom. Uh, and then there is the duty to bargain in good faith. Uh, all of these provisions, the structure of these provisions, is to alter the background rules. These provisions are not part of the normal background primitive rights which happen to protect our freedom of associate, uh, to associate. They, these provisions construct very specific right-duty relationships which are not part of the normal set of rules applying to all citizens. They are rights and duties created specifically to protect this freedom for this particular group, employees, for a particular purpose, associating. They are rights, which are properly called derivative rights. They are derived from because they are necessary to the exercise of the freedom to associate. So, most of this is pretty simple labor law, but for those of you who don't think about this all the time, here's just one concrete uh, example of how these provision works. I just read you Section 53.3, no employer can fire you because you've joined a union. Without 53.3, without at common law, an employer can fire you for joining a union. Right? Without 53.3, an employer is free to dismiss, with reasonable notice, an employee who joins a union. We're not to hire such a person. This is just the basic common law idea of freedom of contract. It's the Supreme Court of Canada in Christie and York. You have absolute freedom of contract to decide with whom you will bargain and with whom you will not bargain. Both sides have it. It's a form of freedom. The employee also has the freedom right, to decide which employer to work for or not work for. Right? That's just the common law, however unfair the common law is in all its equal splendor. The whole point of 53 is to alter that legal world, right? which still holds for almost all other reasons for hiring and firing and contracting more generally. It alters the world of equal freedom, which the normal background rules construct. It does so by limiting, most importantly, the employer's freedom. This is done by granting employees rights, which impose duties on employers. So we go from a world of contending freedoms, I'm free to bargain with whomever I like, and the employer's free to bargain with whomever they like. If they decide they don't want to bargain with somebody who's a union member, they can do that. That's their common law freedom. We go from that world of contending freedoms to a world where the employer's freedom is taken away and replaced with a duty and a right given to the employee. The employee has a right and the employer has a duty not to dismiss the employee because they joined the union. Right? The common law world is restructured. We go from a world where it's just both parties having equal freedoms to a world where we trade off, in effect, the employer's freedom in order to protect the worker's freedom. Now. Bear with me, uh, we'll get to the Constitution right now. But the basic idea is this right freedom distinction and the distinction between things you do that affect my interests and things that you do that affect my rights is critical to understanding the structure of common law things and then to understand the structure of the trade union act, right? It really is about moving from a world of contending freedoms to a world where we're constructing these derivative rights largely in favor of workers uh, and duties upon employers. Constitution. This is the final move, common law, statute, constitution. Now, the suggestion is with this structure and thought in mind, we can see what's really going on in our recent charter cases on 2D. We now have a charter. We now have section 2D. That's something new. Before, we just had the common law with its normally in place background of perimeter rights. 
We had the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act with its set of specific derivative rights protecting the freedom to associate. Now we have a constitutional guarantee. What does that add? Well, every constitutional scholar uh, agrees that what it adds, in addition to the normal common law set of primitive rights protecting my freedom against other private actors, in addition to my statutory rights protecting my freedom against private actors, we now have a right against the state that is 2D at a minimum is, uh, what 2D does at a minimum is to add to the pre-existing common law and statutory rights a new right against the state that it not infringe the freedom as it so, so dramatically did in BC Health or Air Canada. Now that's the easy part. Everybody agrees that 2D does that. But here's the hard part. The hard part is not when does 2D protect us all against state interference with our freedoms. It is rather, when does 2D protect us against other private actors interfering with our freedoms? To put this in a more common form, when does the charter create or force legislators to create derivative rights? That is, when is there a constitutional duty on a legislature to pass laws restricting the freedoms of private actors, mainly employers, which interfere with worker exercise of their freedom. When is, the question in these cases is, in the hard cases is, when is there a constitutional duty to alter the background rules? We do it by statute in the Trade Union Act. But now the question is, when is there a constitutional duty for the legislature to do that? And the best way of seeing that is to see this through the right freedom distinction. When is there a constitutional duty to interfere with the contest of freedoms normally in place, impose right duty relationships mainly on employers. Right? When must the state do that because 2D says there is a freedom to associate? That's the hard case. Why is it hard? Because we actually are trading freedom for freedom. We're actually saying there's a constitutional duty to interfere with one set of private actors' freedom in order to uh, protect another set of private actors' freedom. That's what makes these cases tough cases. So, to come to the cases, the question in Dunmore was, was the state obligated by Section 2D of the Charter to create for agricultural workers Section 53.3 and 53.1 type derivative unfair labor practice rights against private actors, i.e. employers? Right? Dunmore, yes. 2D does require the legislature to interfere with the background set of rights, to move away from the contest of freedoms between employers and employees, and to alter that structure and put in place rights for employees, unfair labor practice rights. Right? It's quite a, uh, uh, I think it's quite important to see exactly what's going on in Dunmore. The questions in BC Health were first, did the state, not private actors, not, not employers in the agricultural industry, but the state, violate worker freedom of association by tearing up collective agreements and forbidding future negotiation? Answer, yes. Second question in BC Health. Whether 2D required the creation of Section 35 type derivative duty to bargain rights against private actors, i.e. employers? Answer, yes. So what's being put in place in Dunmore is the unfair labor practice provisions now are constitutionally demanded. In BC Health, duty to bargain is now constitutionally demanded. What I'm, what I'm trying to make clear is the structure of that demand, that what's happening here is the Constitution, according to these cases, is demanding that the legislature alter the normally in place background rules, contending freedoms, right, and substitute rejig those contending freedoms by putting in place these right-duty relationships, these derivative rights, in order to protect the workers' freedoms. Now, the question in Fraser was whether the state was constitutionally obligated by 2D to create all of the other derivative rights and duties of the Ontario Labor Relations Act in that case, all the other rights and duties in the Wagner Act model beyond 53 and beyond 35, such as exclusivity, the right to arbitrate, and so on and so forth. Answer at the Ontario Code of Appeal, yes. At the Supreme Court of Canada, no. Now, here's the point of all this slog through right freedom, interest right stuff. Here's the payoff. 
I think we're now in a position to see the really big problem that we're left with after Fraser. Dunmore and Fraser really are derivative rights cases. The claim really is that 2D obligates the government to alter the background rules and create legislative derivative rights for these employees with correlative duties on employers, right? 2D really requires the state to rejig the background rules in order to protect the employee's freedom. But BC Health, like the trilogy before it, or now the Air Canada case, or the Canada Post case, is not a derivative right case. Right? The claimants are not alleging that the state had a duty to intervene to alter the normal background rules governing the rights and freedoms of, private, of other private actors. They're not cases about private actors at all. The complainants in those cases were complaining that the state ran over their freedoms, not some other private actor. This is a very important distinction. Now, so what I'm saying is these are just two different categories of cases. Dunmore, Fraser, the state agricultural worker cases, BC Health, Air Canada, Canada Post. Right? Why is it important? Because it's fundamental. Now, the language I use to capture this distinction is the following. Dunmore and Fraser are cases where the agricultural workers go to court and say, the legislature has to go to bat for us. They have to go to bat for our freedom. They have to legislate these rights against these other private actors, agricultural employers, who are, who are making it impossible for us to exercise our freedom. It's a plea for the government to go to bat for us. The other set of cases, the Trilogy, BC Health, Air Canada, the Post Office, don't have that structure at all. These are cases where the government itself is taking a bat to the freedom. Right? There's a distinction between going to bat for cases and taking a bat to cases. This is absolutely basic. This is what we've lost sight of in Fraser. This is the real, real problem. Now, um, I'm going to repeat myself here, but let me just review this once more. Uh, in these going to bat type cases, going to bat type four, the state really is asked to create a derivative right. right? We really are asking the state to alter the background rules. We really are asking the state to take away the freedom of one party in order to protect the freedom of the other. That's what makes them hard cases. In those cases, we need a test which marks off the sort of circumstance where we should do that from the rest of the world where freedoms are merely left to compete. We need an answer to the question, why is the freedom of this person to be altered by the imposition of a duty upon them, granting a right to the employee to be altered? Why is there a positive duty to legislate here and not elsewhere? Why is the normal constitutional default rule that the only obligation on the state is to respect the freedom, not protect it, not sufficient? Now, here's a puzzle for labor lawyers. Right? We've been doing this so long in our statutes that we're so used to having the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act that we've actually lost sight of the structure of what's going on here. But statutorily, we've all, we all know that for a very long time we've had an answer to those questions because we say to each other, the reason we alter the normal background set of rights and freedoms, the reason we create these derivative rights, the reason we trade off freedom for freedom is because of inequality of bargaining power. That in the absence of these derivative rights, if employees are just left with their normal common law set of freedoms and rights, this perimeter of rights, they will never actually get to exercise their freedom to associate. Now, that seems to be the sort of test articulated in Dunmore and Fraser for our constitutional law. Only the test there is extremely stringent. Right? You can get it statutorily by meeting this inequality of bargaining power test, but statutorily, only very bad, I was going to say constitutionally, only very badly off workers, the especially badly off agricultural workers, get the benefit of the constitutional obligation to create the derivative rights. RCMP officers don't get it. Michelin workers would not get it. Even Walmart workers won't get it. Only this terrifically badly off agricultural workers uh, get uh, the constitutional 
uh, get the Constitution to kick, on, kick in for them, go to bat for them. Justice Basterash and Dunmore distinguished the claim of the agricultural workers there from the previous claims by saying the reason they get derivative rights, the reason there's a positive obligation to legislate derivative rights here for agricultural workers is that their fundamental freedom would be impossible to exercise without the derivative rights. That's the test which gets repeated in Fraser. Right? That constitutionally, we do it all the time statutorily, we create these derivative rights. But constitutionally, there's only a constitutional demand to do that, a constitutional demand to do that in these extraordinary cases where it would be impossible to exercise the freedom without the derivative right. Now, here's the main point. That impossibility test, or some other very high standard like it, is a test we only need when we're asking the court to create a derivative right. We only need it in Dunmore and Fraser. This is not a test which should have any application at all in cases like BC Health or Air Canada. Right? Nobody in those cases is asking the legislature to pass derivative rights. Nobody's saying the Constitution demands in BC Health and Air Canada that the state create derivative rights, that they trade off somebody's freedom for my freedom. Right? All that's happening in those cases is the state is taking it back to the freedom. There's no trade-off here. There's nothing hard about these cases. Right? The idea that the stringent test of impossibility should be deployed here is extremely odd if you think about it. It's inconsistent with our basic understanding of the Charter. This is the basic mistake that the majority makes in Fraser. They say, they really say this, the protection for collective bargaining all goes back to Dunmore. They say all the cases are Dunmore-type cases. They say that BC Health follows directly from the principles enunciated in Dunmore. They say they are all derivative rights cases. They actually say at numerous points and for the first time that the right to collective bargaining is merely a derivative right. They say, and here's the critical quote, quote, in every case, every Charter 2D case, Freedom of Association case, the question is whether the impugned law or state action has the effect of making it impossible to act collectively. Now, this is all very wrong and very confused, and I think we've seen why. When the state interferes with the exercise of any freedom, whether it's freedom of speech or religion or thought or association, the question is, are we free to do this or not? And the answer lies in whether the state can justify the interference or impact upon the freedom under Section 1 of our Charter. The question is not, do you, the citizen, really, really, really need to exercise the freedom? The question is supposed to be, does the state really, really, really need to interfere with it? Now, the hidden result of Fraser is to confuse these taking a bat two cases and the, uh, uh, going to bat four cases. They are different. The result of this confusion is the setting of the stage for a real evisceration of fundamental freedoms. We have lost the distinction between the easy and hard constitutional cases. All the cases are now hard. This is a bad idea. Now, here's the implication for uh, the right uh, to strike, say, in the Air Canada circumstances. If the freedom to strike, okay, for example, is seen as a derivative right, and thus one afforded to individuals only if they really, really, really need it, that is, it would be impossible to act collectively without it, right? Uh, then I think we are just depriving uh, 2D of any meaningful content. We're very unlikely to have a meaningful protection of a very fundamental liberty. Now, the drift of my argument is that we can avoid this, but the first necessary step to avoiding this circumstance this result of Frazier is to clearly see what Frazier has done. And then we can buoy ourselves up a bit by reminding ourselves there is hope, right? Recall, this is what Pepsi got right. The same Supreme Court of Canada can actually bring to bear the correct legal thinking, can recall the simple basic distinctions between rights and freedoms and how they inter interrelate the common law and our statutes and in the Constitution. The court in that case was prepared to ask the questions that the lost ideas force us to ask. When do we need derivative rights 
for employers in that case? And when do we leave the contest of freedoms alone? And in Pepsi, they answered it correctly. There is, in this case, no good reason to interfere with the contest of freedoms and create a derivative right for the employer against the picketers. Just get the law out of, out of here, show me a tort or a crime, then we'll have some legal action. This is very basic and very important for all of our constitutional law. We are confronting uh, these hard cases. I mean, we do have cases like Dunmore and Frazier. In these hard cases of when does the Constitution require the legislature to pass derivative rights, when does the Constitution require the legislature to alter somebody else's freedom in the name of another party's freedom, and when not, that is a tough question. Um, but by seeing that question, we got heresies properly overruled in Pepsi. We're also able, if we think clearly, to see what's really at stake in Dunmore and Frazier and agree or not whether it was sensibly answered. You might take the view that Dunmore and Frazier are way too narrow. This test of impossibility leading to only very badly off agricultural workers getting these derivative rights is wrong. All workers need these derivative rights. Walmart workers, you know, it's true, there's no mushroom factory organized in Ontario. It's all true, there's no Walmart store organized in Ontario. Right? So many labor lawyers would say, all workers need the derivative rights. Right? Others might take the view of Justice Rothstein's dissent and say, and I think that's what he's saying, but it's unclear, we should never do this. We should never use 2D to take away somebody's freedom to create a derivative right in order to protect somebody else's freedom. That's just to misunderstand the concept of a fundamental freedom. Constitutions don't do that, right? Well, we could disagree about that, and I think um, we will be disagreeing about it for uh, quite a long time. But the point I'm making is those disagreements are pertinent only to dunmore Fraser type cases, only to cases where we actually are asking the court to create derivative rights, to alter the background rules, to trade off one person's freedom for another essentially, to take away the employer's freedom and replace it with a right in favor of the employee. Right? My point is, we, don't, we are nowhere near those hard questions, and we should be nowhere near a test of impossibility when we aren't asking the court to create a derivative right, where there's no private actor who's created, whose freedom is being traded off in, the, in sight at all. So in Air Canada, in BC Health, we just have the unedifying circumstance of the state taking it back to the freedom. And I always thought, and I think most constitutional lawyers always thought, that when the state does that, they face a heavy notice. Not the victim, but the perpetrator faces a heavy notice, heavy notice to prove that, yes, we are taking it back to your freedom, but it's justified under our Section 1 test of the Charter. Um, we've got that completely backward. What Fraser is saying is there's no distinction between derivative right cases. There's no distinction and the other cases. There's no distinction between taking a bat two and going to bat four. And that's what really, really worries me. My view is that we are all interested in freedom, real freedom. In some extraordinary circumstances, agricultural workers, that the Constitution requires the alteration of the normal and formally equal, equal distribution of legal freedoms of others in the name of protecting their legal freedom. We have a stringent test in these going to bat four freedom type cases. But there the issue really is freedom for freedom. And the claiming party must meet a strict test, i.e. offer a very powerful justification for the trade-off of the other person's freedom for theirs. The party arguing for a limit on freedom of others meets a high hurdle. But because freedom is what is important, we also never let the state simply take away the freedoms of Canadians for reasons of inconvenience, ideology, or anything else. In these taking it back to the freedom cases, the test cannot be won with the heavy onus on the citizen, but rather on the state, that is, the party seeking to limit the freedom. Frazier gets this very wrong. So um, my view is we used to have two categories of cases, easy and hard. They're all now hard. That's not good. It's not good for people interested in protecting their freedoms. Now, in preparing for this visit back home to Dell, I was leafing through Innes's book based upon his Cambridge thesis, The Liability of Strikers in the Law of Tort. And at the very end of that book, in fact, in the very last sentence, uh, Innes um, makes a point, which I like to think I'm trying to make here. He's, he's, at the end of the book, he's saying, here are some of the things I didn't get to cover, including strikes in essential services. 
and he wrote, and I quote, these are matters which are beyond the scope of this book. But it is clear that provisions in our law for emergencies and special cases will be adequate only if they are superimposed on a law that provides rationally for normal industrial disputes, close quote. Now, that's what I'm pleading for, rationality, clear thinking, all in the name of protecting fundamental freedoms. And the reason I wanted to speak about this tonight is that I think the Supreme Court of Canada is making it really difficult for us to think rationally in these important type of cases. That's my argument. Thanks for listening to it. Upstairs, uh, and uh, we probably would all like to go into the drink, but we're all committed to the issues which Brian has been talking about. And Brian has uh, uh, indicated he'd be willing to take questions for 10 minutes or so, and uh, I think it would be fruitful to hear people's views and hear people's questions. Do you want me to play referee or are you going to come up and play professor? You have to play a question on the first and then I'll Is there Diane? Diane sitting in the front seat where she always sits. And in my classes, she'd look up at me and say, That can't be right. <laughs> Are you going to do that, Diane? <laughs> the Air Canada versus the Canada Post. The Canada Post is fairly an ability to challenge it on a constitutional basis. In the Air Canada case, what's for me even more disturbing is that they did it all without the passing legislation. Mm -hmm. And you said you were upset that it was public reaction. I thought the most of great reaction was that of the Canada Industry Relations Board that didn't just say this is garbage, to say this is an example of service. And on this point, Diane knows what she speaks for many reasons. She's a constitutional lawyer and a labor lawyer, but she also worked at the Canada Labor Relations Board. Well, it's now the Canada Industrial Relations Board. It's changed its name. Canada. It's the same place. And in fact, I used to work there before you. Uh, I agree with you. I thought it was a shameful performance. I actually had to sit beside the chair of the board at a dinner in the middle of this and felt quite constrained in my ability to actually explain the facts of life to her. But uh, at any rate, really not to the biography side. Um, I think uh, the board behaved very bad, and if I didn't chair the board, I would have handled it very differently. I'm sure you would have as well. There was also the extraordinary moment where they issued a press release, which was, in fact had a legal conclusion in it that by the minister doing this, they didn't start to be illegal. They do this by press release. It's quite a funny, funny thing. But the part that I think you're maybe getting at is that the real, what, I actually think the Air Canada case, the reference to the board under section 107, Right. It's not a constitutional case at all. It's a Ron Corelli in the custody. It's a Smith and Rule. It's just an abuse of discretion, which wouldn't stand any Ron Corelli type analysis or Smith and Rule type. In this, under section, most people know about the uh, uh, essential services argument that the minister mounted under section 84, I think, with the code. But she actually sent two missives off to the board one under section 84, telling them to acquire in the essential services. But she sent a second one under section 107, and that's the one I quoted for. Under section 107, she can refer questions to the board, but what she did was refer a question which no interpretation of that discretion could possibly comprehend. She's telling the board to do things the board itself has already decided would be legal to do, like impose binding arbitration on parties to an industrial dispute. It's quite an extraordinary thing, but so I think you're right. I, I think uh, it's just a pure, it's, it, there's a constitutional problem that's bubbling up here. But on the facts of Air Canada, there's just a straight ahead administrative abuse of discretion uh, case, which I think we should all keep our eye on uh, as well. But then we should have hope about that. I mean, the safe injection site case came down just a couple of weeks before. It is just like Ron Corelli. It's just like Smith and Rula. My former student, Tony Clement, the minister, right? abuses his discretion. 
and he's got to make a call. The court says you make it irrationally. That's not the way we allow people to exercise discretion in Canada. It's a very, it's just wrong Corelli. These are all, it's just Smith and Ruler. In all these cases, some part of the apparatus of state power, the Labour Board, or the, or, the, or the Prime Minister, or the Minister of Labour, whoever it is, right, has a discretion. The board may certify it. And the law steps in and says, that doesn't mean you get to do what you want. Law is not about whim. Law is about rationality. Law is about attending to rational, relevant considerations. So I think there's, you know, I, I, I think, you know, in spite of the fact that I think we're in tough, in tough spot here, post Frazier, there really are bright lights around, like Pepsi and the safe, uh, inside safe injection site decision. So I think there's reason to think that we still do, as I said, have a court that's willing to stand up for these things. I think my problem is I actually think it's just weak thinking. It's not that is I think they've really got themselves in a deep confusion here, and that's what I want to clarify. And the hope that if you could just see what's really going on, and it's very different in these two types of cases, we'll end up with two different tests for these two different cases, a test appropriate to each, not one test which is appropriate on one side, but totally inappropriate on the other. It's a tough argument, though. I really wonder whether to, to, to run a lecture which had an argument in it. I thought of doing something of the sort we were doing in um, the class with the students and sort of do something like Harry Arthurs did last year and have an overarching thing about the you know, future and past of labor law and so on and so forth. But I actually came to the conclusion that this is so disturbing that it would be worthwhile actually trying to nail this uh, but I, I, uh, I hope it wasn't a terribly serious error, and I thank you for your indulgence. Very uh, large question. These are, these are, this is terrible. Two of, the, two of the best lawyers ever to come out of the school, jumping all over me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did leave me a little bit confused. Good for you. Uh, at first, as I was listening to uh, the way you worked your way through the issue, I was thinking to myself, well, isn't this what uh, people refer to as formalistic freedoms, rights, uh, because it seems to me that uh, there are circumstances, socio-economic circumstances, in which the exercise of a freedom is not possible without the state intervening to make that possible. And, but it did seem to me then later on in your analysis, you seem to recognize that. That's what left me confused, that, that this the freedom may actually require rights to be recognized in order for people to exercise the freedom. And I'm not sure whether you accept that or no, not. I think you've got it exactly right. I do accept that. And, and remember, this is an argument about clarity and legal thinking. It's not an argument about power. It's not a political science argument. It's not an industrial relations argument. It's not a sociological argument. It's not an argument about making a more, more productive Canada or anything like that. I'm really trying to lay bare the architecture of thought, which is in play, which is at stake, which is actually being fiddled around with when we make those judgments that you point to. So the whole point of starting with the common law and this formal distribution of equal freedoms, right, is to show exactly what we're doing when we step in with the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act to rejig those in the name of the very concerns that you mentioned, right? So I, I, all I'm trying to do is lay bare the legal structure of the very move that all labor lawyers are so terribly familiar with. Right? The common law distribution of rights and freedoms is purely formal, and it means from the employee's point of view, right, they're never going to realize uh, what it is we want them to realize in the labor market. So we step in and we rejig the rules comprehensively. Right? The Nova Scotia Trade Union Act is a comprehensive rejigging of both employers' and employees' freedoms across the board. It's a complex system of completely rewriting the background rules. Employees lose their freedoms too. I've been concentrating on the unfair labor practice provision and the duty of work, but they lose their freedom to strike for recognition, they lose their freedom to strike for enforcement. So it's a complex set of trade-offs. This is why I think at the end of the day, the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act is not unconstitutional. It's such a complex set of trade-offs that it's going to pass section one. It prima facie violates everybody's freedom all the time. But it's going to pass section one muster because it is a, such a complex set of trade-offs. Now, so I'm with you. In our class, I'm trying to make, in the class we're actually doing two things. I'm running this technical legal argument. And I actually believe that when you strip out the economics, the law, the power, the sociology, the industrial relations, there still is law. It's not reducible to all these other things. So I think if we get this basic legal thinking straight, 
we can then step back and lay, make our, make our political judgments about how we should play this game. All I'm trying to lay bare is the game that we are actually playing. And I think most labor lawyers are very accustomed to the fact, both employer, employer lawyers and union lawyers, that the way we play the game here is we have systematically rejigged the rules, right? A lot, and mostly in, the, in favor of employees, in the name of increasing their bargaining power, in the name of the theory that they suffer from inequality of bargaining power. That's the whole purpose. But that kind of political purpose is one thing. How we go about it is what I'm trying to lay bare. And unless we pay attention to the details of how we're going about it, we start with freedom, freedom, we move to freedom, derivative right, duty, right? And then we get to the Constitution. Uh, I think it's really important to keep these distinctions in mind, to see that in some cases we really are asking the court to say that the Constitution demands that the legislature rejig the rules, but in some cases we're not. That's what it's just, just, it's just freedom straight out, no derivative right being asked for at all. So, and, I, and the, the cost of not being analytically clear is the confusion we get in Frazier. It's they're so muddled. I mean, they, they still believe there's a distinction between collective individual rights. It, I mean, there's a confusion upon confusion upon confusion up there. And all I'm trying to do is clear it out of the way and say, look, these cases look like this. These other cases look like that. They are not the same thing. They do not all come from Dundee. They are not all derivative right cases. But the good stuff, and in class, we have most fun doing, we're reading Amartya Sen and Arthur Bisbaum and capability theory, all with a view to coming up with a theory that would tell us how do we know when to rejig the rules. And the, my view is the old theory that it's all about inequality of bargaining power, feeling sorry for the weaker party, that's an inadequate theory. We can have a much more robust theory about why we have the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act or the Human Rights Code or the Employment Standards Act. So in the, in the class, we're actually doing both of these things. We're trying to run the technical, lay bare the architecture of the argument stuff, and then lay on top of it the normative stuff that would tell us how to play within that system. So, but we didn't do that today. But come to class. <laughs> I think we need a drink, don't we? Oh, hell, I can do that in five seconds. Uh, my main argument, is, as some people in the room know, is that this whole 2D extravaganza is completely unnecessary, unhelpful, and we'd be way better off if we argued cases like Dunmore and Frazier as equality cases. Why? My view is the Ontario Labor Relations Act, which is the act at stake in Dunmore and Frazier, uh, is the legislature's attempt to instantiate Section 2D freedom of association. We have these three words in the charter, freedom of association. How many words are there in the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act? For the Ontario Labor Relations Act, ten thousand? I don't know. know. Thousands of words. What those words are doing is trying to make real, legally enforceable, concrete, enforced by labor board people like Bruce with real remedies, right? So you can really have things. You get people's jobs back, right? To bring it down from the abstract constitutional international human rights norm to a real instantiation of that freedom to associate for real Canadian workers. The problem in Dunlar and Fraser is that we have a fundamental failure of equality. We've made that freedom real for almost everybody else, but left these people out. The real question in Dunmore and Fraser is, how can you go around making a freedom real for virtually everybody else and leave us out, the particularly vulnerable? That's, that's an equality claim. That is, I think it's the unequal distribution of the instantiation of the fundamental freedom, which is really at stake. Now, the reason we don't argue it as a Section 15 case is the Supreme Court of Canada has read down Section 15 from an equality provision to a non-discrimination provision. This is terrible in my view, right? I believe that at the very minimum, Section 15 should cover what it does cover now, protection for what the Americans call discrete and insular minorities, right? anti-discrimination function. But it should also protect the distribution of fundamental freedoms. Right? So I, I, I think this is just this whole show from Dunmore. Dunmore is an attempt, this is going on two minutes, to shove a seven, Section 15 case into 2D. It just won't go. It's a square peg and a round hole problem. And this, that's, that's why we end up in this mess. So we're trying to do something that's conceptually really uh, incoherent. But more than that, if we did it under Section 15, life would be so much easier. 
people used to talk about this in class, about the paths of virtues, right? Section 15 is the easy way to cut through this. If we do these cases under 2D, we have this unedifying spectacle of the Supreme Court trying to imagine what these three words mean. Does that include a duty to guard in good faith? Does that, they'd have to conjure out of the three, three words something like the whole of the Nova Scotia Trade Union Act. That's a very difficult thing for judges to do, right? It's also undemocratic, but it, you know, it's, it's a really, really hard, hard thing. Under the Section 15 route, we don't have to know what the meaning of 2D is. We don't have to be able to say, I've divined the true meaning of the three words, freedom of association. All we have to say is, we may not know what the perfect theory of freedom of association is, but we know how Ontario has instantiated it, right? And all we're saying is, if you're going to instantiate it that way for virtually everybody, you've got to do it for everybody unless you've got a good reason. You can't leave somebody, some, people, some folks out, right? You just can't go around protecting fundamental freedoms for some people and not others. That's just an unequal distribution of the freedom. And the result of that would be we would have no constitutionalization of the Wagner Act. We wouldn't have, we now have constitutionalized unfair labor practices. We now have a constitutionalized duty to bargain in good faith. We came, you know, if Winkler, you know, had been the Supreme Court rather than the Court of Appeal, we would have a constitutionalized complete Wagner Act model. I mean, that's what Warren Winkler did. And Warren Winkler is one of the best labor lawyers in the country. I, mean, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, uh, my view is that's a big, unnecessary, costly mistake. And I think for people like you, Ray, and union side people who have to litigate these things, the court has now created an enormous barrier for you, right? Because they're now, they now see this constitutionalizing a Wagner Act model problem as a real problem. So you're, every time you go up now and ask for something, a right to strike is going to be next, you're going to be fighting an unnecessary demon and then going up an unnecessary hill, right, of the constitutionalization of a particular model argument. Do it under Section 15, you're home and dry. You don't fix that challenge at all. So I think it's, it's got built-in headwinds for realization of the freedom, doing it under 2D. And then to make work, matters worse, we have Frazier, which just gets these two tests mixed up for these two very different types of cases. So not only do you face this specter that haunts these cases, you now have this impossibility hurdle you got to get over, right? That's a really, really bad, bad situation to be in. It's a bad situation for our freedoms to be in, not just for you and your clients, but I mean, what's happening now is, right, they're saying anybody who brings a 2D claim has got to meet this impossibility. They have to prove that the state has made it impossible for you to associate. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the other way around. The heavy onus is supposed to be on the state to say, we have a really good reason for interfering with your freedom. That's the normal structure of things. They've really messed up 2D for everybody by missing some very fundamental stuff. That's the argument. <laughs> said everything we uh, need to say. Um, it's certainly wonderful to have Brian back in town. Uh, he has no objection uh, in speaking truth to power. Um, I was at a conference where uh, Beverly Laughlin was the uh, headnote speaker and just after BC Health was uh, decided and Brian very uh, carefully, politely, but pointedly uh, in his presentation the next morning where she was present, told him why, told her why the Supreme Court had got it all wrong. <laughs> uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, reading the, uh, the version which I hope he will provide so that we can publish it in the Dalhousie Law Journal of the, the written, um, the written uh, product so that we can study it with more care. Um, I, I'd like to say as well that uh, for those of you who attended the uh, first conference last year, uh, the first Christie Visiting Lecture Conference and Symposium, uh, the Dalhousie Law Journal uh, in, with those um, articles is going to be out very soon and people who are attendees uh, will receive a copy as I understand it. So we're looking forward to that. And we're all looking forward to socializing and having a drink upstairs. And thanks to Elizabeth Sanford uh, to, for organizing this event and uh, making my job very simple. Uh, thanks very much. And for organizing our reception upstairs, too. Thank you.